started in agency life by accident. Yep. You know, I designed a website for uh, kind of making fun of one of my friends that looked like Justin Timberlake from NSYNC. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we called it InShit. Yeah. And then it got popular. Yeah. And then people just started asking me to design websites. I was like, yeah, sure, 500 bucks. Yeah. And uh, just kept No doing, problem. I don't know why it's always 500 bucks. No. Right. I, whenever I interview people on my show, it's always 500 bucks. We're like, is that just an easy number? 500 bucks. People? Yeah. And so literally uh, I got my start and then, uh, years went by. I started hiring more and more people. I just kept growing the business and working with clients like LegalZoom and Hitachi and AT&T and building their brands and, and Lotus Cars. And, you know, 12 years later, someone offered us a check and we were like, peace out. <laughs> Sweet. Drop <laughs> the mic. And didn't know what to do, but I was completely depressed. And uh, you know, tried an iPhone app and hated that. You know, tried investing, hated that. And uh, I was just lucky enough that some of my old competitors started asking me for help about, hey, how'd you land these big clients? How'd you sell? And I just started helping them out for free. And my wife, who's a lot smarter than me, was like, why don't you do that as your next venture? Right. And so just started putting content together and putting uh, amazing people together that ran agencies and creating resource I wish I had and the rest is history. Yeah, that's cool. So uh, family side, you mentioned your wife. Yep. And when did you guys meet? I uh, met her the first day I moved to Atlanta. Nice. The first day. Um, and uh, a mutual friend from college and high school introduced us. And uh, then I was off the market pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> and then kids? Yep. I have... Uh, about to be 13 and a nine-year-old, two boys. Awesome, so it's busy. Yeah, real. my real job, guys, is an Uber driver for my children. And, uh, <laughs> oh, they, I wish you could just get them to pay you for it. No, they don't. Yeah. Like, I pay them to <laughs> Uber them around, yeah. I was uh, leaving for work, and I have a four-year-old and two two-year-olds. Oh, and, and they're like, uh, are you going to work, Dad? I was like, no, I'm gonna go help people grow their businesses. This is work. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, like when when the weekend comes, sometimes I, I get stressed out. And I'm like, oh, hey, here it comes. Like, how does my wife do this it's all day long? Straight up. So, um, I mean, that's a really solid. I mean, you're, you're probably the first person ever in the history of I'm in a car that did the synopsis of, of where you came from to where you are today in the timeline that I was hoping for. So, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. For being so concise with that. Um, so when you when you started off and you, you talked about growing your team, what, what kind of uh, size of team did you end up at before the check was written? We were a little, little, literally a little over a hundred. Hundred staff. Yeah. That's a lot. And going from just you, yeah, to a hundred. Just staff. a freelancer, right? And uh, yeah, that was a big learning curve. And and even I, I remember my first client. They asked me to send them an invoice. I didn't know what an invoice was. <laughs> you're like googling. No, oh, their Google didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. This, this yeah, is right. You're right. You're so old. I was yeah, like, God. you know, I, I, what, what is Google? I had to ask my dad, and my dad was like, Ask Jeeves. <laughs> no, that wasn't even around, right? And literally, the first website I did was on a GeoCity URL, like that's awesome. because we didn't buy URLs. Right. I, I didn't know about that back then. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, going from one to five is a big jump. Going from five to twenty, I've experienced a big jump. Right now, we're about thirty-five staff, and I, that was way different than running ten. Yeah. I've heard fifty is where a lot of CEOs kind of break, and they have a hard time evolving and growing themselves. And then I can't imagine a hundred. So it gets what, easier. What, what were the? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So can you just break it down a little bit for people? Yeah. It it really gets easier. Um, you know, when you get to about twenty-five, thirty people. What you'll start seeing is, is you're like, man, the business is making more money, but I'm actually making less. <laughs> That's not right. And you're, you get really stressed out. You're like, you have, and you're at a pivotal point. You can kind of move forward. And the only way to move forward is having the right systems in place for yourself as well as your team. And I, we can talk about those as well. Or you can say, you can go back and you can kind of go back to just a, you know, a business that depends on you, right? Like. Because I, I really believe that you're more of a, like an agency owner or a business owner, they do everything, right? right? The whole business is depending on them. But an entrepreneur, your main job is hiring people to do all the stuff for you. Right, that's a big difference. Oh, big difference. And But then when you start hiring the right people and you start hitting scale, it gets easier because you're only managing four or five people at a time. Right. And you're coaching and mentoring them and you're setting the vision and communicating that vision to them, and then they pass that on to the rest of the team. 
So then when you, when you were doing that, which is great, I mean, the whole purpose of I Am In A Car is to learn from entrepreneurs so people can grow their business. So when you, I mean, did you stumble upon that? Or did you have that plan when you were a freelancer? You're like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to grow this to 100 people and do these right. systems. Like, where did that stuff start to hit you and like what kind of experience did you go through? And this is where I'm hoping you'll be honest about the shit that is the entrepreneur roller coaster. Oh yeah, I mean, so I always wanted to own my own business, right. um, but I didn't know what it would be, right? I remember like even at an early age, I used to watch this show called Be Witch, if you remember, like with the, um, had the, uh, she, well, she was a witch. A and cartoon, then, uh, Bewitched? What, what, well, no, but no, it was, um, had a guy that he was an ad man okay and that was a husband and his wife was a witch right and he was always presenting kind of pitches to people and i always just found that fascinating and i always wanted to be that that type of person that would come up with that ad for tv right and so i the really liked Morgan, guy. the idea guy but i didn't know what agencies were i was just like i want to pitch right i didn't know what i wanted to pitch right and so i remember taking an internship uh in my sophomore year in college and I remember all they had me doing was stuffing envelopes. I was like, is this marketing? <laughs> this is shit. Like, this is crap. Like, I'm doing direct mail, like, just stuffing envelopes. And so I remember I was always kind of that type of person that wanted to get out of the boring stuff. I wanted to do the good stuff. So I, I was like, email was just coming out. This right. was around, like, 97. Yeah, okay. And so I went to um, yeah, 97. People were like, I wasn't even born for 97. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so sad now. I'm an old freaker. Um, <laughs> But so I, I did this presentation for the, the owner and I said, hey, you know, you could save so much money if we did email, we could reach a lot more people. Right. And it wound up like saving them 250,000. She's like, you should go into computers, information systems. Right. And my dad at the time was like, dude, there people are paying signing bonuses. So I kind of changed it a little bit more toward computers because right. I was chasing the money, which um, obviously worked out. but. I would suggest not to chase the money. <laughs> <laughs> At least it was lined up with a passion, though, right? Exactly. It was more of a method. Yeah. So then I, I went to work for Arthur Anderson right out of school. Cool. And hated it. <laughs> um, worked for them for about six months. This and I is and, and literally made them fire me. I've never I've never had a job I wasn't fired from. And, and I finally realized why. It was because I'm not a quitter, but I want to make it miserable for them to make it, make them quit on me. Right. So then I have no choices. So I really had no choices other than to start my own business. Right. And can you give us a quick insight in what you have to do to get fired from Arthur Anderson? I mean, yeah, you, you just don't show up or you watch <laughs> movies at your cube. You just do office space. You, you, yeah. You tell them like, oh yeah, I can code. And here's the deal. Here's the only thing I learned in college was how to outsource. And this ah, is not, nice. right. So I paid people to do my programs because I hated programming. I, I just was chasing the money, but I was more resourceful than everybody else. So when they wanted me to program, I'd be like, I don't know how, like, I, like, I just want to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're fired. It was pretty easy to get fired. Nice, right? nice. Or laid off. Right, right. Down right. Downsizing. That was, a, that right was the sizing. term. Right. That's cool. So, so you let you see so you got fired. Yep. And then you said, "F it, I'm going to go start." Yeah, and I was already building websites for people on the side, side and, and I loved it. Right, you know and. And what was the, even the first question? I know I went down a rabbit hole. Well, that's all good. It was just talking about the idea of like, how the heck did you learn to oh, do right. these systems? Where did, where did the insight come from? Over time, right? I, I remember there was a pivotal point. We had about 15 people in the agency. And I remember doing my budgeting. And my budgeting included opening up my bank account and going, oh, I don't know if I have enough money for payroll coming up. Yeah, it's a great. And that was pretty stressful. And I went through that a couple times. So I always made payroll. But I kept going through that. And I was like, there has to be a better way in order to do this. And I, I started really looking at why are we struggling so much? And it really came down to kind of the roles I was playing and who we were going after in the systems we had. First off, think back at my origin story. I didn't know, I, I just got started by accident. Right. I didn't have a clear path of where I wanted to actually go. So I was just being reactive to all the business coming to me and it was referrals. And the re problem with referrals is you either get the same amount of business or less. Right. And it's not controllable. So you got a pulse and a check, I'll take you on as a client. Yeah. And so it just wasn't scalable and, and it wasn't predictable. And I 
was like, and I'm keep charging the same amount even though I'm getting more and more people. Right. And I didn't like that. I wanted to charge more. So the first thing I did is, is like, all right, who are my best clients? Who are the types of clients that um, I could provide amazing value for? Because if I, I realized if I could prov provide them amazing value, I could charge more. And they'll be happy about it. Yep. And if I could charge more, I could hire the right people. Right? And you can see where it kind of all stems. And it snowballs. Them. Yeah. It's, it's a huge thing. And so I started doing that. Then I also started realizing what I had to do is, is I had to position ourselves in a way that looked different from everybody. Because I'm not going to compete on price. A lot of times people would compete on price and they'd be like, well, in order to compete on price, I need to lower mine. And I never wanted to race to the bottom. No, no, I no, just no one wins that, that race. A, I, I think that was a mistake. Great, right, they're gonna think we're gonna pick up and steal a, ch a child. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna turn he, around. He's driving into a school. <laughs> I'm doing a U-turn. So anyway, you're gonna you're gonna char you want to charge more and yep. then figure out a way to and differentiate. We, and we wanted to position ourselves a little different. So what we started doing was we were like, all right, everybody always talks about themselves. Let's change it, right? And I started thinking about conferences. We've all been to conferences where people go and say, uh, you know, they come up to you and they'll be like, hey, Jason, uh, my, my name is Rob and I do X, Y, and Z and I'm the best at X, Y, and Z. I and, love that experience. And, right? And you're like, dude, this guy, how do I get away from him? <laughs> and that's what all of our competitors were doing. And that's what everybody is doing. Still. And still. And I was like, well, how can we change it? How could we start off and start the conversation about them and ask questions because if you've ever had someone go hey how can I help you why did you yeah. come to this conference is, yeah. you're like oh this is interesting because it's about me yeah right and they're going to like that conversation so we wanted to change that focus we wanted a position different and then what we also realized was if we were going to charge more and we wanted to win deals quicker we needed to change our offering and we couldn't pitch marriage right off the bat like if I went up to my wife you know, or if you, anybody went up to their significant other and pitched marriage right off the bat. No dice. The, we, if they said yes, then you should probably run, run. the other way. <laughs> You're like, what's wrong with you? This is not okay. Yep. And so we needed to change the offering and we needed to make it an easier decision so we could build trust with them. And so we thought about like, how can we create a small engagement to build trust, show them value, and then once we show them value, then we can charge way more. Right. And we have a longer term client. And so we started doing these types of things as well as, as we were doing this, I was changing my role into kind of five roles, right? Remember, I said, set the vision and communicate it to the team often. Right. The other one was coach and mentor my leadership team only. Right. I couldn't mentor 15 people or 20 people at the time. It, it was just impossible. So I had to have the right people in the right seat and give them the tools that they needed in order to do that with the rest of the team. The other thing I had to do is I had to understand the financials. Now, I wasn't um, amazing at arithmetic or any sure. of that, right? So I had to hire people that could set, like I would set the KPIs and then I would hire people and be like, what do we need to do in order to hit this? How much do we need to charge in order to increase this profitability so we can afford growth and, and really keep? Because everybody's always focused, especially in the B2B world, or the service-based world, they're always focused on top-line revenue, which yeah, at well, the end revenue, of the day, it doesn't mean anything. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. Yeah, exactly. And and and, and they're focusing on the wrong thing. And if they focus on the wrong thing, money is controlling them versus them controlling money. Yeah, that's cool. And so just before I keep, like, there's a whole bunch of ideas that you just presented right there, and I'd love to dig into a couple mm -hmm. of them. So one of them was this idea of that, this I might not hit payroll, pain, fear, emotional anxiety, created a change that said, I need to do things differently because I don't want to feel like this anymore, essentially. Yep. Which is really weird because, well, not weird, it's natural, but human beings, we have this tendency to wait till it hurts for us to make change. And so I guess the first thing I want to say just to the audience is don't wait for it to hurt until you start making things different if you're not where you want to be. So what what was it other than, I mean, you said, okay, I got to start doing this differently. And then you just said, I got to look at this differently. Pretty much, yeah. Well, I mean, the biggest thing and the first thing you need to do is you have to have that clarity of where you're going, who right. you're helping. Like, you can't move on. Like, so many people come to me or they come to you and they probably want strategies for growing their business, like right. tactics. Yeah. But you can't get into tactics if you don't know where you're going. Like, you if you want to sure. climb Mount Everest, you can't just start walking up it. You right. have to come up with, like, here's the goal. 
And then here's the strategy, then here's the tactics. Right. And at least with that, you've, you've got a destination. And a lot of people don't even have that. Yeah, you're just walking around in I the wanna, desert. I want to grow. Yeah, yeah I want to yeah, I want to grow. Yeah, I don't work with people that just say I want to grow. Like be specific. Yeah, please. <laughs> so then the other thing you mentioned, which I thought was really interesting, was the idea that, you know, just coaching the leadership team only. And you put emphasis on only. Um, I'm curious where the emphasis why why the emphasis on only and then where were you coaching were you with with, with team members where you were reluctant to let go but knew you had to? Well, I mean, you're always especially at like when you're smaller, you think you can do everything better than everybody else. And once you start letting go of the freedom, then you'll be surprised. Like for example, let's say we're on a boat from New York going over to London, but everybody on your team didn't know where we were, where we were going, right? right? And so after about 10 hours, I get tired, I go down in the cabin, go sleeping, and the boat starts changing. And I told them, if the boat starts changing course, come get me right. and I'll fix it. Right. And so every freaking minute, they kept waking me up. You got a minute? You got a minute? Yeah. You got a and I'm like this. But if I just told them the destination, they could, of course, correct it. Like, for example, um, a couple years ago, we I had my team working on um, a blog post for the top marketing conferences for agency owners to go to. Right. They listed out about 20 of them. Two of them, I was like, no way. They're complete a-holes. We're not listing them out, right? I hate these people. <laughs> and my team was like, but is it good for agencies? I'm like, yeah, yes. <laughs> and they're like, and I'm like, fine, right? So they could call me on my BS, which is great. And they had, they could make decisions, what's with where the organization's going. That's cool. Not with just coming to me. So when when you're dealing with uh, that that growth, and you started coaching your leadership team, and not everybody. What uh, what stage of the game were you at? How many team members did you have? I think we're around about 15 or 20. Yeah, okay. Right? Um, and this was over time. This wasn't just like instant, right? right. I, you know, there wasn't podcasts back then. Right. You know, and the, the crutch I had, and the crutch I probably still have, is I don't read. I have ADD. Like, I You're hate books. Entrepreneur. ADD. I'm just like, I'll learn by doing it. Right. And listening to other people. Um, and so it took me longer. That's why, you know, in today's world, like everybody running a business now, like every day I listen to like two episodes of podcasts when I go for a walk or a run in the morning, right. just so I'm always constantly pushing myself. You're sharp. Yeah. And so then when you get to 50, what was that like? Cause I've, I, I haven't got there yet. We're, we're on our way. Um, but I've heard it's a breaking point and I, and I haven't gotten too many specifics on it. Yeah. You have to kind of, you have to commit fully to growth and you have to kind of burn the, the boats behind you right, you so you can those. only take the island like you have no choices right. and, but if you're not committed to growth it's kind of like a, you know I ride mountain bikes and it's about to hit this big jump but then you're kind of timid on it <laughs> and, then you get and, and there's like a huge cliff right <laughs> and you're like well I kind of but if, you, if you're not totally committed you're going to keep looking over at the cliff and you're going to fall down yeah, versus good. just like screw it I'm going to just jump it and if I crash on the other end, great. I'll survive. I can play again. Yeah. But if send I, it. Yes. You just got to send it. Yeah. Very Jeep term, right? That's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. So what, when you say commit to it, you know, conceptually, I understand what you're saying. Uh, but specifically, what is it that you mean in terms of the, like the day-to-day -day in business world? Yeah. So the, the other part is, is as you commit to it, you have to make sure as you're coaching all these people, they have to have that clear direction and they have to, and you have to have the right people. And this goes back to your core values. And a lot of people kind of just say, oh yeah, I have core values. I just check the box. Like some, some stupid consultant told me to do it one time. And, and I just, you know, I was like a oh, hard integrity. worker, integrity, transparency, quality, I love transparency, quality right? <laughs> you know, good service. Trust. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> you have to kind of dive deep into your core values, right? And go, what are your core values? And then surround people with that believe in that, right? right? And that get excited about that. Um, and that's how you need to hire. Like Zappos is amazing yeah. the company, right? They I mean, always talk about core values. They hire on it. They ask questions that would relate to it. Like, you know, part of ours is being resourceful. If you're going to be on our team, you have to be resourceful. So in the interview process, we would say, all right, tell, tell us a time that you didn't know something and had you figure it out. Right. Or what was a time that you had lacked, lacked the resources and, you know, did you fail? Did you 
Were you successful? Walk us through that. We wanted to see their thought process. What did they do? What did they go through? And, you know, it would just, they'd be like, okay, some people would just quit. Or a lot of times, um, if you asked them questions, like stupid questions, like, all right, you're on a square island. Around that island is a 10 foot moat. It's infinite. And you have two sticks that are nine feet long. How would you get off the island? Right. And you just want to see how they think. Yeah. And, and figure There's out. There's no right answer. Well, there is a right answer. You oh. take the two <laughs> sticks, you let, it, the, the key is a square island. And you take one stick and you light diagonal and then the other one over it. Oh, well played, sir. Right? But you, but you, you want, I, I wouldn't have gotten that. Yeah, you want to, but you want to see people be like, can I tape it together? Like, right. you want to, can I phone a friend? What kind of questions are they asking? Exactly. What kind of options are they trying to find? Yeah, the, the point is not figuring it out. Right. But the point is, is like their thought process. Like, are they going to give up? When do they give up? Right. Like, I would even let them go through it. Heck, I've been, even interviewed people in full race gear. So I used to race cars. Yeah, yeah. And I'd come in with the visor down. I just wanted, like, there would be certain people, like sales people be like, I want to sell out. Yeah. That's cool. So I mean, one of the things I think is really neat too about what uh, Tony Shea and, and Zappos, um, and to, to echo your point, reinforce the idea of core values, is that uh, there was a question in an interview, they asked him like, you know, you, you put so much emphasis on hiring and, and, uh, and culture um, and building culture, but you don't talk too much about how you manage and sustain culture. And he just answered quickly, we don't. We, we put all the effort in up front, and then people with the same core values make the same types of decisions we want to make, and then we don't have to manage and sustain it. it. It does it by itself. And I love what they do, too, is and they try to weed people up from the very beginning. So whenever they hire someone, I, uh, and I wish I knew this when I was hiring um, for the agency, and I tell a lot of my clients to do this. When you're about to hire someone, before their first day, offer them a big check just to quit. Yeah. And that will tell you if they're in it for the money. Because a lot of times when I look back at our best team members, you know, that became like family to us, yeah. they, they weren't in it for the money. They were in it to be bigger than who they are. They That's wanted cool. to be significant. They wanted to contribute. They wanted to grow. And you got to think about like as human beings, what are all those kind of those traits people have and which ones are they going to hire? Like I think Tony Robbins says there's like seven of them, right? right? And we all rank them differently. Like yours and mine are probably very similar because we're entrepreneurs, right? You know, significance is a huge one. Sure. Like when I sold my agency, I was completely depressed because, you yeah. know, you had no I, purpose. Didn't, I didn't have significance anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, people are like, oh, you're successful, but success without significance is complete you know, utter devastation. It's great. It's, it's interesting though. You say that too, because, um, I'm part of an organization called EO. Have you heard of it? Entrepreneurs mm -hmm. organization. And so I've had a whole bunch of people, uh, a couple in my forum and a couple in our chapter that sell their businesses and they're like so excited and they celebrate and then they go into this funk for like a year plus sometimes. Well, they're on top of a mountain and they go, this is our peak. Right. And that's what I thought. Right. When I, when I sold the agency, I was like, all right, this is as good as it gets. Did now, it? Every, now everything's down. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was like, right and then you just don't have a purpose anymore and then when I found this I was like oh my god I can be a resource I wish I had yeah that's cool. and then like people are saying that you're changing their lives by just things that you go over and you're like this is so fulfilling cool so and so then in in that destination to the peak um, was there a spot where you were just like F this I'm gonna throw in the towel on the way oh so many times I, I remember I got to one point um, my wife was like, dude, just quit. And I'm like, really? Like, quit? And so I remember um, uh, interviewing for a position for the uh, CMO of NASCAR. And so remember, I was a race car driver. Yeah, like, so I'm like, sweet. this would be amazing. <laughs> and I remember them asking two questions. And they said, what do you want to do every day? And what don't you never want to do ever again? So I went home and I really thought about it. And so what I did is I got a piece of paper, uh, eight and a half by 11. And I drew a circle about as big as my fist. Yeah. And everything within the circle, I said, this is everything I love doing. I want to do every day. And then I started kind of process of elimination, everything on the outside. I said, no. And then I was like, I just need to hire people to do that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. Right. And that was a big change. And then I started enjoying it. And I was like, why would I go work for someone else that's going to tell me what to do? You know, where I can create it myself. And right. so that was a big pivotal point, you know, over the next six months of going, all right, rather than work on my weakness, 
let's work on my strength and hire for my weakness. That's cool. And so one of the ideas on that note, um, and I, I talk to a lot of people about similar ideas and ask them, okay, well, why don't we hire somebody? And they're like, well, we don't have it. We don't have it. the resources, money to, to hire somebody. And it ends up into this conversation of, do you push your team and stretch your team to build you know, resources and call, like coffers and like a war, war chest? Um, or do you kind of put money out for first and, and build capacity so that you can handle it? And, and it's like this kind of double-edged sword and it doesn't seem like there's one right answer. So what's your, what's your take on that? Well, I, I think you always could sacrifice. You, you can do a little give and take. Um, if you want to get, you have to give up something. And so a lot of times the owners are probably still making some good money. So do you really need all that money you're taking out of the business? Right. Just invest. Yeah. Like the best investment is always in yourself. Why keep putting money in the stock market or 401k or any of that in the short term? Use that money to invest in your, your business. So do you see that often where owners are maybe taking a bit more than oh, yeah. the business can handle? Yeah. Or they're going like, they'll be like, oh, I'm struggling, Jason. I'm like, oh, well, how was that four week vacation? Right. Like, did you really need to take that? Like, yeah. you're not struggling. Yeah. Or, you know, they're just, they just bought something big. Like, we keep buying something stupid in order to impress people because we're vain. Like, I remember hearing a story um, with uh, Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive. This was after Steve Jobs died, and Johnny Ive was talking about this over video. And he goes, you know, one time Steve was getting on my team, you know, really hard. And Johnny was like, Steve, why don't you ease up a little bit? You know, they're, they're doing they're doing their best. He goes, Johnny, I thought a lot more of you. He's like, what do you mean? He goes, you're vain. You care what other people think. We should only be producing the best product we could possibly can. If you stop thinking about what other people will think, we could get to the best product. And he was like, shit, that's totally right. Bit of a jerk way to say it, but he said it, and I needed to hear it. Yeah, exactly. And then he's like, you know, that's like, and he believed in, you know, the beauty of design and all that kind of stuff. That's yeah, why passionate. for a while Apple was just the dominant player. I still think they are, but they still not innovating like they used to because yeah, they, they don't, they don't care as much yeah. in, in like every little detail. And it's amazing what happens with leadership, right? Success kind of really does rise and fall on leadership. Mm -hmm. And so then, so the, to the business owner and stuff like that, what is there, uh, in your experience, you know, working with hundreds, thousands, I guess now, right? Uh, agency owners specifically, but entrepreneurs generally speaking, uh, like a, a percentage of, or some sort of ratio, there's a kitty cat on the road and he's okay. Go cat, run. <laughs> With a collar too, so you know that's a good cat. Um, a ratio where uh, the owner should be taking out only so much as a percentage of revenue or of profits or yeah, just any type of guideline that can give owners some idea. Well, you need to look at, you need to look at going, in order to get something, I heard this the other day, and this was like a, a high school student, or a, no, she was a freshman in um, college, and she was a track star. Yeah, okay. And she goes, in order to get something that you want, you have to turn down something that you like. Ooh, cool. Right? And so I think you need to look at, like, what are all the things that you like right now that you can say no to in order to get something you want? And just get it to the bare minimum. Like literally, do you like? Could you, do you really need a five hundred thousand dollar house? Could you go rent a, an apartment? Like I love that advice from Gary Vaynerchuk. He's like, sell all that that kind of stuff, live in a small apartment for two three years, build that business up, and then you'll be able to buy a mansion later on yeah, yeah. when you need it. Right. Yeah, that's. But cool. there's. We're just not resourceful at a lot of things. We just go, we keep acquiring stuff. Like what I learned over the years as our salaries kept going up and up, I'd be like, crap, you know, I'm making more than most people, but I still feel poor because our lifestyle keeps going up. And so the and cost we, of living is, is cost, rising. Yeah, and you're, and you're like, if I could just strip out a lot of this stuff. So when I sold my agency, the, the, the one thing I bought in the short term was a $500 bumper for my redneck Jeep. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. It's a sweet redneck Jeep. Oh, that was, no, it was a, it was a dumpy. Oh, it was a, it was a real redneck Jeep. Yeah, it was a real redneck Jeep. Yeah. Right, like I didn't go out and buy stupid stuff. Um, you know, I put that money away. It was just like, I didn't want my lifestyle to go way up and then feel that poor and feel imprisoned by having to do the next thing. Yeah, 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 that's cool. 
I think, that, I think that's uh, something that a lot of people need to hear a lot more. And I heard the same thing maybe a couple weeks ago. Was uh, Jim Estill? I'm not sure if you've heard of Jim Estill, the CEO of Danby Appliances. Anyway, they pretty large company, and he took a company from zero to over two billion. And smart dude. And uh, he was saying the exact same thing. He's like, you don't you don't necessarily uh, need to live that way, no. but at least you should learn that you can if you need to, and what it looks like. So that way you have an understanding of like the luxury you're living on top of. Um, and I think that's something that's really, really important because uh, even, you know, for myself, I, mean, I don't think I'm in that position right now. I, I certainly know I'm not. I'm definitely investing and in all of our owners are, there's three of us. Uh, but I think it's a really, really good lesson because if if you even take, you know, 20, if you have a couple owners, like in our case, uh, you take $20,000 off of someone's annual income each and then all of a sudden you've got salary for a whole new great staff member. Um, that makes big a big, big difference. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So then... Um, when it comes to, to systems, which is I know you're a big proponent of systems, there was something that you said at the at the mastermind four years ago that just kind of like I don't know for, for whatever reason it stuck with me, and it was this idea about you know even if we're doing something for a client for free, they're gonna get an invoice that says zero on it. Oh yeah, the zero dollar change order. Yeah. So can you just break that down? What's that all about? Yeah. So um, the biggest thing that hurts service based businesses is the scope creep. Oh yeah. Right. And clients don't do it on purpose. Like as I'm building the house in Colorado, you know, I'd go to the builder. It's a custom house. I'd be like, oh, cool. Can we do X? Can like, we put storage in the stairs? Yeah, or like, so every we, stairs is a, is a no, Mine was more like, can we do a zip line from the top <laughs> yeah. down? Right. Like that's included. Right. And they'd be like, no, that's, I mean, we could do it. Yeah. Or can we do this infinity pool that like wraps around like a moat and we can do it. <laughs> yes. The answer is we can. Do but that. it's not included. And like, I didn't know, I'd be like, oh, you just told me like, we give you this amount of money and you go, go do it, right? Yeah. And so people are uneducated. So a lot of times you have to educate them and train them so they don't train you. So what happens on most, most of the time is a business or the client will go to the business and say, I want to do X. And then the business is afraid to say no. And they, they're like, okay, we'll do that. And then they keep doing that. And the you know, the clients keep asking and asking and they're not doing it on purpose per se, right? Sure. I mean, it's, it's been behavior that's been accepted. Exactly. And so what we would do is we would start training them. So uh, we would do on little items, we would say, sure, we can do this. It's actually outside of the scope of the project, but what we're going to do is we're going to zero it out. But what I need you to do is sign this and on this piece of paper, it would say, all right, we're going to do five extra pages, uh, extra thousand dollars, and we cross it out and be zero. Right. They physically sign it and have to fax it back to us. <laughs> nice. <laughs> E-fax or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. And so they fax it back, and so, um, and then over time, as they would do more and more, when they would ask for the big items, then we'd be like, oh, okay. So we've already done five of these for you. Um, so we can't do this big one and in order to do this, it's going to cost X and yeah. they were fine Like they were trained and then as a business owner You can look at the sheet of papers at the end of the month and be like holy cow I'm giving away a lot So then you figure out what you can say yes to what to say no to and so that's what we did in order to You know increase our profit because a lot of times you know scope creep just kills all of your profit sure, and Mark then you're like gone. oh I got this hundred thousand dollar deal, but I didn't make any money well but shame on you. That was your fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what do you say to the person that says, that sounds like a lot of administration. That seems like it's more burdensome than it is helpful. Well, I would be like, do you want to be profitable? Or <laughs> uh, do you, do, are you willing to do some burden? <laughs> like, right. it's like that. I just think some people have this, because like, I, I agree with you 100%. Like we've uh, thankfully live in a bit more of a digital era and our administration administrative burden is, is way lower because we can do like digital agreements and everything's done in Salesforce and it's epic. Uh, but there's a lot of people that don't necessarily want to slow down in order to get it right. And they think just moving forward is, is better. If, if you want a different result, you got to do things differently. I mean, it's, it was a smart guy that said something like that, right? Yeah. Expecting a different result, doing the same thing. I don't know who it was, but it's <laughs> totally right. Like, like it's, it's, it's kind of like if you want to lose weight and you keep eating, eating the Twinkie, like whatever it is. And like, I always, and like, I remember Tony Robbins was explaining how we make decisions. We either make decisions for two reasons, to gain pleasure or to avoid pain. Yeah. And whichever one we 
put my more priority on is how we're going to make the decision. So like if I eat that Twinkie, well, I'm putting more pleasure on short term versus long term. Yeah. And so you got to kind of change your thinking. Same thing on, are you going to send that zero dollar change order? Because that's more short term pain, right. but in the long term, you'll be profitable. Yeah. Well, and it's the same thing too. Like what you said, even just a couple minutes ago about, um, getting rid of things that you like so you can get things that you want. Mm -hmm. There's our theme there for sure about some short term pain for long term gain. It's always give or take. Like yeah, you're not, you're not going to be able to just take, take, take. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's like this people at the conference, they're just trying to take yeah, yeah. and right. They're not making deposits before they make withdrawals or they need to make deposits before they make withdrawals. And they so. never do. And we don't want to be part of it, which is it's so true. And uh, we always talk about this idea at Intrigue where people live in a society where they hate to be sold, but they love to buy. And so it's just like helping them buy stuff, creating an environment for purchase yeah. as opposed to an environment for sales uh, being super important. So then um, when, it, when it comes to systems, when you're talking to business owners, do they, one of the things that we got, we got a board of advisors and we got kind of hammered on this at the beginning. They were like, where are you making money? Where's your gross profit per service, gross profit per client? Like, who, where are you making your money? And we were like, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, this one's big, you know? So wh what's, what's that like in your experience working with entrepreneurs? Forget just even entrepreneurs. Yeah, it, it all comes down to focus, right? Like we think by the more things we do or the more services we add, the more money we can make. But a lot of times I look at it as like Steve Jobs, when he came back to Apple, he got rid of a lot of the stuff. And I think, I, I remember hearing somewhere too, it's kind of like figuring out which are the stars, which are uh, the cash cows, which are the dogs, yeah. and, and which are, um, and this was by uh, some consulting firm, and which are the ones that you can just say no to or, yeah. or opportunities. Gross margin, uh, like optimization. Yeah, like the stars are one where- High margin, high volume. Well, high demand and a lot of profit, right? And if you can get those, great. But some are cash cows too. They're not growing, but they just make you a lot of money. Yeah, okay. And then the dogs are just, they're costing you a lot of money. Why you do it? Just say no. And then the ones below, I can't think of the name are, um, they're not making money, but there's opportunity there. And right. it's usually in an industry where if you can educate or streamline, then it's huge. And you should diversify in those three cool. and say wrong to the dogs. And so when you look at a service-based business, you have to look at all those and go, all right, which are the ones making you a lot of money? And which are the ones that if you were only going to be paid on performance only, which ones would you do? That means like, these are the services I rock. Like there's too many service-based businesses out there or businesses that are doing stuff that doesn't provide any value whatsoever. But they're doing it because someone's willing to pay for it at some level. And I'm like, well, they're eventually going to get smart. And if you're not providing what you say you're going to do, then you don't need to be in business yeah. or you don't need to be doing that. Like if you're doing pay-per-click and you suck at it and you're known as SEO, you should kill the pay-per-click division and just do SEO. So then how does somebody, cause I, I mean, what you just said makes complete sense and I totally agree. Um, and in, in your experience, how does someone figure that out? Where are you making money? Because some people are like, well, if you look at our accounting, this line item has been growing revenue, it's all revenue. Um, so how do they start figuring out if they're making money? Well, you have to look at the amount of hours and manpower that it's taking to support that, to figure out the, you know, the net profit for those products or services that you're doing. And once you figure out the most profitable ones, then you have to look at going, could we grow this? Or is this fully tapped out? Right. And then you can be like, all right, I can go for it. And then just totally commit there. So there's something that you said there that was very important. How many man hours, you know, people hours, whatever. Mm -hmm. How does someone do that? Time track everything. 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 And a lot of people don't like I was losing money on 60% of our projects and engagements that we did. I was just lucky that 40% were hugely profitable before we started tracking time. So oh, that's what you found out once you started tracking time and you're just like, Oh my. Yeah. I just kept assuming that, Oh yeah, we got a hundred thousand dollar project. Cool. We'll, we'll make, Oh yeah. We're 40% margin. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. I'm like, Oh crap. We were losing money on that. Crazy. I'm like, why do that? And then people are like, well, I do that so I can make payroll. 
I'm like, well, but you're still losing money on it. Yeah, like, that's, it, it, that doesn't that doesn't sell. That's like, a Twinkie. You're you're paying someone. Yeah, you're eating a Twinkie in order to gain weight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that does not make sense. It's uh, so I'd love to hear then from your perspective and your experience doing it, going from a non time tracking culture to a time tracking culture, and how you affect that change and that discipline. Well, it was it was hard to tell everybody to do it, and then I, I realized. I'm the freaking boss, and they won't get a paycheck unless they track their time. It's really that simple. I mean, it's 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 really not that hard. You you go, oh, no one's going to do their time tracking and, and report that, and um, you know, and then people fought it. And I said, well, okay, well, if you don't do it, I'm not going to pay you. And they're like, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I love how simple you put it too, because I, I mean, we we did the same thing, right? We didn't know what was going on. We had to put in time tracking, and then. And it was really simple. We're like, this is the performance expectation. Yep. There's no, we won't listen to anything you have to say unless your time's been tracked. And it, it, it did, it happened pretty pretty easy. It might have taken a couple months to get everybody yep. like fully on board and it, and it working really well. And now it's rocking, so the culture's even better. And the people that fight you the most, they're hiding something. They're the guy, they're the Arthur Anderson <laughs> YouTube Yeah, they're, they're, they're me, <laughs> yeah. not doing their job, and they know they're gonna be called out. Yeah, so I mean like, how many out of 10 agency owners that you talk to, how many of them have teams tracking time? Maybe before they work with me? Yeah. Oh, maybe 40%. Crazy. Yeah. And so then for the 60%, do they all make the, the change? I mean, I guess if, if they, they keep working If, if they want to keep working with me, <laughs> some don't. Some, some fight it. They're yeah. like, well, okay, I can't help you. Yeah. Straight <laughs> up. It's that simple. And, 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 you know, and that's a big thing, too, when you realize you, you get to the next level is, is you can't help everybody. You can only help the people that want to be helped. And so there's no convincing. There's no tricking, right? You know, it's not an impulse buy. It's yeah. just like, do you want help? And then figuring out and then going back to that simple question, if I was going to be paid on performance, would I take on this client? Do they meet that type of criteria? That's a really, really cool question to ask. And I don't think many people do. No, they just take it on, they're like, oh, 100,000, cool, I can get a, a stupid another car or whatever it is. Sure. I do a Lambo, so then I can do a stupid video. <laughs> What's up? Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I love that. Or rent a Lambo, that's yeah. probably, that's, that's, that's what Several Lambos. Do. That's what those Or find do. a parking lot full of them and then do a video. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the people that just stand in front of like a Prius. And they're like, what's up, my Prius? <laughs> You're like, I want to follow that guy. Yeah. Um, so you, you said something that was really interesting, right? Like you can't help everybody and where, where would I go if I was just being paid for performance? Um, when you were talking about the idea of differentiation, you said flipping the conversation towards um, them, you know, the viewer or the visitor or the client or whoever it might be, and not about you, the conference guy that everybody hates. When it, one of the things I've heard you mention is this idea of not becoming a, a Me Too agency. Now, this is before the Me Too movement, so I'm not trying to talk about. Yeah, I've been know, trying to. Come yeah, up with careful name. with that. Yeah, I, I just call it Me Too business. So, yes, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, but the idea of being the same as everybody else, right? And digital marketing is an interesting piece because everybody has access to Google and Facebook and, yep. and email and MailChimp and web development and all that stuff, all the tools. It's a pretty equal playing ground until you start getting into like, you know, technical specialization or even maybe platform specialization. And so what did you guys do um, to, to niche yourself? Like how did you decide what niche to, to take on and then where, where did you actually end up going? We, we so you did. weren't uh, the same as everybody yeah. else. We did it around software that was growing. So we did it around a, a company called Sitefinity, right. around content management systems, um, or content management systems. And then we also did it around a small company called Microsoft, around SharePoint small, and yeah, small company, tiny right? But at the time, not many people were doing partnerships with them or strategic partnerships. Right. So we could make that those types of software do anything else. So we made Microsoft look good. Yeah, we made cool. Sitefinity look amazing, right? Um, and so then people started coming to us for that because we were the specialist, yeah. right? We weren't the generalist, right? Like I always laugh at people who are like, all right, so you need brain surgery, but you're going to go to a generalist to operate on yeah, you? Yeah, I'm, like, gonna, I'm gonna go to my family physician. Like, okay, they haven't ever done surgery. <laughs> they have doctor. 
yeah. and PhD, but that's about all. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so, I mean, they check your oil, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and so then, uh, did like, who had the capacity to do that inside your team? Like, how do you, did you say, okay, you know what, Site Infinity and Microsoft? It was by accident. Ah, there it is. So how right? did it happen? So we started developing a content management system, our own software, right. in 2001. Right, okay. This that's is before that's anybody. A, that's a beast, yeah. Right? We did the same thing with email marketing. We did the same thing with e-commerce. But here's the deal. We didn't separate the teams. And so when the client would need work, we always client did client time. work. Yeah, yeah. And so we never could really get going or support and make these softwares ama amazing. So then when we found these amazing platforms we could build on, we are like, they're going to support us, make the amazing features. We'll just need to tweak it. That's cool. And make it look awesome and, and make deliver it look a great awesome. experience. Yeah, so we're like, this is gonna save us time. So we fell into it by accident and then we became the leaders, like the best in the world for Sitefinity implementations and customization. That's how we got LegalZoom. Awesome. Right? That's how we got a number of different big clients, you know, coming to us. And so it was by accident. And then we started going, all right, and that's kind of a horizontal niche, right? Right. But you also could do a vertical niche and say, I am only going after banks or higher education. And we started creating practice areas for higher education. We started creating practice areas for automotive. Cool. And having people lead those, right, in order to go do that. And I, I, I love that for a lot of reasons, um, because I think what I heard you say was you started making decisions and then you'd run with it and if it didn't work out, you change it. Or if it did, you yeah. just keep going with it. I think a lot of people get caught up with, well, if I start to focus too much, then I'll alienate everybody else. But it's this counterintuitive idea that if the more you focus, the more you grow, because you are alienating other people, you're not taking everybody on. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like the biggest, it's the hardest switch for people is to, to realize that you have to make, fully commit to pissing people off, <laughs> right? Because then you'll attract the most amazing people. And like this, like think about Facebook, how they started. If you remember back, MySpace was dominating back yeah. then. And so if Facebook tried to be everything to everybody, they would have never been anything. Know, anything. They started off Harvard and then Ivy League and then high schools and then yeah. ex-boyfriends and girlfriends stalking each other and then grandmothers stalking their kids, right? Yeah. Like, or, or mothers stalking their kids and all that kind of stuff, right? So they started small. So everything big starts off small and you have to laser in and then you can grow. Now, when I say niche down to, you still can take on work outside of it that you know you can help, but you're just marketing to that particular niche. I love it. The idea of just, the niche is where you focus on getting clients doesn't mean it's the only clients you work with. Correct. And, and then you give power to your sales team in order to figure out who to go after versus going, what market do you want to go after today? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then they can't learn about it because what I truly believe is you have to understand your perfect prospect better than they do. And you need to be like, all right, what is their biggest challenge? What do they want? Like uh, Seth Godin, I interviewed him not too long ago on the show. He's a gem. Oh, amazing. And I said, well, how could we really separate? He goes, just think about it this way. He goes, you have, a, you have a key. And the person that you want to help wants to get on the other side of this door in this room. The only way they can do that is use your key. So do you want to charge what the keys um, you know, what it costs you to make the key or what it's worth. With the value of what's in the room. Right? And if you're the only one, then you're never having to compete on price. Yeah. You're the only one that can get them in that door. I love that. And I think it needs to sit and a lot of people need to hear that more than once. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because there's this commodity mindset that exists in a lot of people's heads. It's just got to go. So, go ahead. Well, you, you just, like, I... I there are so many people in my space now, and people are like, are you getting frustrated? I'm like, no. I was like, my only competition is cat videos and procrastination, right? <laughs> like, it's just wasting people's time or not making a commitment. Um, you know, it's just because if you drill down far enough, no one can be who you are or like, and, and you really just don't want any competition, but right. you, you haven't taken the time to figure out how to be resourceful or how to drill down and you know, just go do it and, and not worry about, you know, not worry about doing something until it's perfect. I think that's another big mistake a lot of people do is, you know, look at like Tony Robbins. He's one of the best in the industry, right? No doubt, yeah. If not the best. 
but when he started out, he wasn't the best. He leveraged other people. He was like a reporter leveraging other, other amazing people's talent. And then over time, over 40 years, then he built up who Tony Robbins is. And right. if he goes another 30 years, it'll be totally different. Yeah. But if he waited for that, he would have never got started. I wouldn't have ever started. I think that, that's, there was a, I was talking to a, a gentleman, he was talking about podcasts and he got all this gear, did all this research, spent about a year kind of figuring it all out, practiced on himself, didn't publish anything. And in that same year, I did about 100 videos like this. And uh, he just asked me, he's like, well, you know, like, how did you learn to do that? I was like, I don't know, I just put the camera on and went and see how it goes, right? And it's amazing how much more you can learn by getting out into the real world because, like Mike Tyson, everybody's got a plan to the hip punch in the face. Exactly. Not that I want to use him as an inspiration no. leader in my life. But, but he's an incredible person now, yeah, yeah. right? Like, if you watch some of the interviews, he's so grateful. He's like, I'm not that person anymore. Yeah, that's cool. Right? And that's just a part of his, you know, upbringing and, and his situation. But for him to make it out of that is incredible. But, yeah, it's kind of like, I remember talking to someone. They are like, uh, I want to start an agency. I'm like, but I feel like I have to go work for an agency first. I'm like, well, why? So I can learn the business. Okay. Don't You don't think you can learn the business going to, you know, just starting? Yeah, I, I can, but, and they kept saying the but. I'm like, no, you just go do it. Yeah. You'll figure it out. I didn't even know what an invoice was. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I could, like, and there's, and that's just one dumb story. I mean, right. there's just thousands of them out there of, you know, me not knowing something, but able to figure it out. And I'm not the smartest person by far. I'm probably one of the dumbest people, but I can be resourceful and I can see things a little bit different. And I don't care if I fail. I don't want to, you know, fail all the time. But when I do fail, I'm learning and then I won't do it again. Well, and I, there, so that's a really interesting point you bring up. And, I, and it's something that I'm trying to encourage uh, my team, at least our team to, to embrace failure uh, because if we're afraid to fail, then we'll have a tendency not to jump. And we all need to jump so we can learn on our own and, and, and grow leaders. So uh, I think that's a really, really cool point. The, the one thing um, I wanted to ask you, there's two other points and then we'll get you back. To, I'm not, we're, we're close to your place, but I'm not sure exactly. Well, you drove by the neighborhood several times. So I was yeah, like, oh, wow. Yeah, there, yeah, right? yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, you're really good. Um, I would be so lost. Like, yeah. <laughs> I leave my neighborhood. I'm like, where, 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 where am I? I? I'm, I'm, I'm outside Atlanta. Um, so what was the low point for you? Like, what was an experience where you, you know, when you were looking at that CMO job, what was going on in your day-to-day -day that made you think, man, this is tough? Well, I mean, just the, the point of caring what other people thought if I had to lay people off or if I started, you know, if I closed up doors. And, the, and then I just started thinking, well, if I just tried this new way, what's the worst that happens? Start another company, play again. Right. And I just started looking at it like the game of Monopoly. You can play as long as you have money or as long as someone's willing to lend you money. As long as you have access to money. And if you get out of the game, cool, you can start another game. Yeah. It's not like you have one shot. Everybody always thinks, you know, this company that you're doing is it. What people don't know is like, as we I was building up, you know, the a agency in the very early years, there was other businesses that I had the opportunity to do that no one would ever know. We had 1031 Exchange, which was this company that you would buy a, you know, you buy a house or flip it and that kind of stuff never worked. We created a, a social network called My Town. It was actually before MySpace, didn't work, right? Like there are so many companies that we tried that never worked that no one ever knows, but that enabled me to play this game better because I had that experience. Yeah, that's cool. Everybody knows Babe Ruth for his home runs, not his strikeouts. Dude, the dude struck out 70% of the time. <laughs> yeah, and like, I think still holds a major league record for most strikeouts. 70% <laughs> of the time he fell. Like, we were at the Braves baseball game um, a little earlier and uh, with my sons, and they're like, oh, he's got a 314 average. That's good. I'm like, so what does that mean to you? I was like, that means 70% of the time that they strike out. Yeah. That they fail, but they keep getting up, and they're known as an all star. Yeah. And paid millions of dollars to fail 70% of the time. Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> or amazing life lesson. Yeah. So then uh, one one thing you would go back and tell yourself uh, that you wish you know now that you wish or she wish you knew then that you know now? Just focus. Focus and just, just, I don't know, just go do it. What do you mean focus? 
focus on one thing. Don't get the shiny red object. Right. And just go, you know, figure out your purpose and the reason why. Like, you know, what I was telling you, like, I want to be a resource I wish I had. So that, that's our North Star in order to allow us to make decisions. And just once you find that out and you, and you know where you're going, it's easy to make a decision. I think we all struggle with making decisions, but if we struggle with making decisions, it's because we don't have that clarity. Yeah, you have that clarity, it makes it a little bit easier. Thanks, dude. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Cheers. See you guys.